I was helping out at a vacation Bible school several years ago when I saw one of the older participants sitting at a table just crying her eyes out. So I walked over to investigate and one of the other children at the table pointed to a boy who was a few years younger and said, Malachi said something mean to her. So I went to Malachi and I said, what did you say? And he said, I told her she was fat, but I said no offense. And I said, now saying no offense doesn't make it not offensive. So I think you should apologize. Malachi said, but I didn't mean to hurt her feelings. And I said, good, then you can say, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to hurt your feelings. To which he said, but I was just speaking the truth. And I said, even if it's true, it was a hurtful thing to say, so you need to go apologize. Now, at this point, I could tell that little Malachi had run out of excuses for his bad behavior and definitely did not want to apologize. So he looked me right in the eye and said, Miss Mona, it's a free country. And I said, yes, it is. And then I tried to explain to him that just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. That's a tough concept to understand, even for some adults. In fact, the churches in Galatia had basically said the same thing to the Apostle Paul. They knew God had done everything necessary for salvation through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and that they were now free from the power of sin that had been holding them back from becoming the people God had created and called them to be. For freedom, Christ has set us free. But they were having a hard time figuring out what that freedom meant in their everyday lives. We continue to struggle with it even today because we live in a culture where we think freedom means we can do whatever we want whenever we want to do it. It's a free country, right? But we conveniently forget that there are always consequences for our actions and our choices. Max Anders likes to say that every freedom has a corresponding bondage and every bondage has a corresponding freedom. You can be free from the toothbrush and a slave to cavities or you can be a slave to the toothbrush and free from cavities, but you cannot be free from the toothbrush and free from cavities. That kind of freedom doesn't exist. He goes on to say, by nature, it's what we want, absolute freedom, but we can't have it because it simply doesn't exist. Always there is one bondage and one freedom. You choose. The Apostle Paul said, for freedom, Christ has set us free, which means we are now free to choose. We can be slaves to the law, or we can be slaves to one another in love, but we cannot be slaves to the law and slaves to love at the same time. We have to choose one or the other. He said, stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. Now, a yoke is a long wooden frame that's used to harness a pair of oxen that are attached to a plow that they are driven to pull in order to get the work of the master done. But in Paul's day, a yoke was also used by conquering armies to harness people into slavery. If you were harnessed to a yoke, you were forced or driven to get the work of the master done. So a yoke became a symbol of servitude. The people of God considered themselves harnessed to the yoke of God's law, which wasn't necessarily a bad thing. 
the law gave them the guidance and the discipline they needed to do the work of God in the world. But over time, the interpreters of the law added so many additional requirements to keeping the law that the yoke had become a heavy burden, an oppressive weight that was impossible to pull. A daily reminder of their inability to overcome the power of sin that was holding them back and preventing them from becoming the people God had created and called them to be. So God sent Jesus to remove the yoke of the law by conquering the power of sin so that everyone would be free to choose to live another way. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus said, Come to me, all you that are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Freedom in Christ does not mean we've been freed from bondage. We still belong to God to do the work of God in the world. But because of Christ, we are now free to choose which yoke we want to wear. The people in Galatia were claiming their freedom from the power of sin in Christ, but choosing to wear the yoke of the law. The law was a heavy burden, but it was familiar, measurable, secure. A person could look at their actions and the actions of others in the light of the law and know where they stood. Those who were circumcised were in and those who were not circumcised were out. So Paul reminded the people that they could not be slaves to the law that excluded some and slaves to love that includes all at the same time. For freedom, Christ has set us free, which means we are now free to choose and free to serve one another in love. Paul said, For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love become slaves to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And remember, love in the Bible is never a warm, fuzzy feeling. It's an action that always puts the needs of others before your own. This week, the mayor of Indianapolis declared a mask mandate for Marion County that will take effect on July 9th in an effort to prevent an overwhelming surge of new positive cases of the coronavirus. And I have been surprised by the vehement reaction of some of my friends. After a particularly vicious rant on social media, one person said, I can go across the county line to dine, shop in public, and do whatever I want without a mask. Indianapolis businesses paying the price. Several people jumped in, calling it a stupid power play by an incompetent government that's trying to control the masses with a pretend crisis. You've probably heard similar comments from others. But right in the middle of this terrible tirade, a person offered an alternative perspective saying, wearing a mask isn't really that inconvenient. I've been wearing a mask and I will continue wearing one out of respect for my fellow man and the well-being of others. Now we could argue the effectiveness of wearing a mask all day long. There is a plethora of publicized articles and expert opinions on both sides of the issue. But what would happen if we all just stopped arguing and simply chose to put the possible needs of our neighbor before our own? Joanna Adams says, to be free really means to be liberated from the prison of me, myself, and I. 
To be truly free, she says, is to be able to move beyond the self into the risk of love and to give oneself in the demand of service. To be free is to be free for responsibility, not from responsibility. She said, think of how Jesus, who had everything in the world going for himself, power, status, safety, freely chose to empty himself and take on the form of a servant for the sake of the world. Now that is freedom. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Not to do whatever we want, whenever we want to do it. That kind of freedom simply does not exist. Freedom in Christ means we are now free to choose, free to serve one another in love. And finally, we are free to follow the Spirit who will give us everything we need to become the people God created and calls us to be. Paul said, live by the Spirit and do not gratify the desires of the flesh. A better translation says, walk in the spirit, which is a military term that means stay in step. Go where the spirit goes. Listen to the spirit speak. Follow where the spirit leads one step at a time over and over again. But we have to be intentional because our own desires are always pulling us in the opposite direction. Fornication, Impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing. These are just a few of the things the apostle says that are opposed to the life of the spirit. And they come to us naturally. I have a little beagle that loves the smell of rabbit droppings. She will naturally seek out places where bunnies have been and then roll around in it until she stinks so badly that we can't stand to be in the same room with her. But instead of keeping her in a separate room, away from the rest of the family, which is torture for this little dog that needs constant affection, I pick her up, put her in the bathtub, and wash all that filth away and when she's all clean and soft and sweet smelling we love all over her which makes her one happy satisfied little dog but do you know what she does as soon as i let her outside again she goes right back to where the bunnies have been and then rolls she can't help it it's in her nature the apostle paul says it's our nature to do things that separate us from God and each other. But God in Christ has freed us from the driving compulsion of sin so we can choose to live a better way. God has picked us up and washed all that filth away in the lavishness of his mercy and grace so that when we are baptized with Christ, our sinful self is crucified with Christ and then raised to new life in the spirit where we find love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. This is not something we do, but something God in Christ has done for us. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentle, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control is not something we can achieve or even produce with a solid work ethic or a legalistic formula. The fruit of the Spirit is a natural byproduct of a life led by the Spirit that is meant to nourish the whole world. Several years ago, I officiated a wedding for a couple that invited their guests to bring canned food and non-perishable items to stock the local food pantry instead of traditional wedding gifts. Now there was a little over a hundred people in attendance, which meant 
They could have received a whole lot of stuff and money that could have been used to take a honeymoon or build an addition on the tiny house they'd just purchased since they were combining two families that day. But before they were yoked to each other in marriage, they decided that they would be yoked together in Christ, who always put the needs of others before his own. The groom said, Pastor Mona, we are always hearing you say, feed the hungry. And we didn't feel right about throwing a big dinner party just for us when there's so many people out there who wouldn't have a meal that night. So people brought food, so much food that it was overflowing and the fruit that was naturally produced by those two people who chose to serve others in love by following the steps of the Spirit, blessed and nourished the most vulnerable people in their community, not just for one night, but for days and weeks and months ahead. For freedom, Christ has set us free. I hope you were able to eat a hot dog this weekend, watch some fireworks, and celebrate the freedom we enjoy in this land that we love. But I pray that you'll celebrate your freedom in Christ every single day by choosing to serve one another in love as together we follow the steps of the Spirit until all of God's people are free to live this life and live it abundantly, both now and forever. Amen?